in Celtic remotely and also in person and will be filmed and recorded for live and subsequent broadcast available through the Council's website. The Council is a data controller under the General Data Protection Regulations and Data Protection Act 2018. We broadcast and record Council meetings to fulfil our public task obligation to enable members of the public to observe the democratic process. Data collected during this process will be retained in accordance with the Council's published policies available through the Council's website. Members of the Council are reminded that they should follow the Council's established meetings protocols, including around the use of the chat facility, and that comments made in the chat facility are visible to all participants in the meeting, which may include members of the public who have also received invites to the meeting. So with that, can I go to uh, Diane to ask for apologies, substitutions and declarations of interest in the roll call. Diane. Uh, we have apologies from Councillor Maguire with Councillor McCluskey who was substituting for the communities business and Councillor McCabe substituting for the education business. Uh, and we have apologies from Reverend Burke and Reverend Donaldson. Uh, can we now move to attend this roll call before proceeding to declarations of interest? Can the following members please indicate if they are present at the meeting either in person or remotely? Councillor Armstrong. Present in the chamber. Councillor Brennan. Present in the chamber. Councillor Fogarty. Present chamber. Councillor Daisley. Present remotely. Councillor Law. Present remotely. Councillor McKay. Remotely. Councillor McVeigh. Present chamber. Councillor Moran. Present in the chamber. Councillor Quinn. Present in the chamber. Councillor Robertson. Present in the chamber. Councillor Wilson. Present remotely. Hey, Mr. Doherty. Hey, Ms. McEwen. Present remotely. Are there any further declarations of interest that were intimated this morning, earlier this afternoon? Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and before I go on to um, the substantive part of the agenda, can I um, ask for your indulgence and can we remove agenda item number 12 from the agenda? Um, this is amendments to applied policy and admissions and pupil placement in mainstream schools. Uh, we have had discussions with outside bodies and we want these discussions to maybe continue for one more cycle before we, we decide that we need to bring a paper back from that. So I can ask you to clear your indulgence of that. If, if that's okay, we can remove that from the agenda today. Okay, Agreed. Thank you for that. Agreed. <laughs> and, and with that, um, can we move on to the Education uh, Scotland report on your uh, primary? Can I ask Michael to introduce the report before inviting um, Lauren to speak on it? Michael. Three, um, it's my pleasure to report to the committee today on the Education Scotland report on New York Primary School that took place uh, back in February of 2023. Um, as you'll know, we're now back in full cycle of inspection, and this is the second school so far this academic year to have been inspected. Um, the report was published in March. This is the first printing we've had since the publication. And at 2.2, you'll note um, a number of key strengths identified about the school and its work um, across uh, a number of key areas, including the strong pastoral leadership um, from Lauren and, and her team. Um, and the fact that the senior leadership team clearly understand the needs of the school community and are working effectively with partners and parents to improve outcomes for children. Um, as well as that, was noted their, their development of skills and knowledge, um, and I think generally um, a, a strength as you noted at the QI section um, later in the report, um, the 3.1 outcome of ensuring well-being, quality and inclusion 
was rated as being very good, and at five point thirteen, we got the four quality indicators and the gradings evaluations um, that the school received across across those good across all, but very good for um, ensuring well-being, quality, and inclusion. I'm sure co colleagues and, and um, members will have read the full report and noted the content of the recovery report as well as a number of key strengths that were identified. Uh, an area of um, case practice was also picked up and identified by the inspector, but I have to say was it was really, really very pleasing given the work I'm aware that the school have taken forward, and that's the work around anti-racist education. Um, not only is the school um, working hard in this area, um, as I'm sure some of you will be aware, I'm an individual teacher at the school, Katie D'Souza has re recently, um, or this academic year, received the General Teaching Council for Scotland, um, Sarge Lal Award for her work in this area, and the work across the school has been further picked up, and that's outlined as well at 5.13. So a lot of key, key areas for strength in the report, obviously there are areas for improvement at 2.3, um, and I think that's around... Uh, continuing to uh, identify key areas for improvement and monitoring the impact of their approaches to raising attainment and achievement. Um, that the senior leadership team and staff should continue to develop a shared understanding of high quality learning and teaching to ensure that children do receive learning as well matched to their needs. And lastly, that senior leaders and teachers should continue to work together to raise children's attainment and literacy and numeracy, which is really an indication that. They're already doing that work and it should continue and uh, a great deal of impact has already been had both in terms of recovering from the pandemic and taking the school forward. Um, I'd just like to commend the report to you and give my personal congratulations to Lauren and the staff at um, New York Primary School um, for a, a really strong overall report um, and a uh, the recommendation that the Community Education Committee Committee notes the Education Scotland report from your primary school. Uh, thanks, Michael. And I'll invite Lauren in to say a few words to the committee. And Lauren, can, first of all, can I, I welcome you along? Um, thanks very much for taking your time out of this very busy day. And I would like to say a few words to the committee. Thank you very much. Um, so, yes, we were delighted with the report. I think it really represents what we wanted HMI to see when we came in. Um, it read like our school and we were we were really pleased with the strengths that they had pulled out when, when they had been there. And they were here for uh, from the Tuesday right through to the Friday. So they did they did see a lot. Um, particularly pleased with the comments around the ethos and the inclusivity of our school um, and the fact that they recognised that all of our, our whole school team support staff, teachers, SMT. Um, we know our context, we know our children, our family, families, um, and we're the heart of the community, which is what we really have set out to do. So I'm, I'm really delighted that that um, has come through. Um, our partnerships with other schools, um, our partnerships with other agencies and our community links come out really well and really highly. And I think the support that we had as a staff team and I had as a, a head teacher, a new head teacher really, um, from Centre, from Michael and Adam, Ruth, um, and from my other head teacher colleagues, um, particularly the ones that have had a wee bit of experience with HMI. Um, you know, that was really invaluable for me and, and I can't thank them for, for all the support that I have received. Um, two of areas, again, which I'm, I'm particularly pleased about is, is coming out so positively in the report is our development of play pedagogy. Um, it's a bit of a passion of mine and it's something that we have been working on for a wee while. So I'm really, really pleased to see that that came out so well. And as Michael was saying there about um, our journey to for building racial literacy. And for some of the councillors who have attended our parent action group um, meetings, they'll know at the last meeting, Katie did a bit of an input with the parents and the councillors to, to explain really our journey so far. And we've definitely got a plan going forward um, where the children are right at the forefront of that and then a participation in, in guiding where we go with that and, and about the education that's required for the community and Inverclyde and as a whole. And hopefully New York will be able to be there at the forefront of that. Um, as Michael said, quite rightly, there are areas for improvement. 
luckily there was nothing that was new information for us. It was all um, what we were seeing through our quality assurance and systems that we already had in place. Um, and I've had support from our attainment advisor and from my education officer to create our plan of action going forward, which will feed into our school improvement plan and cover the, the most prominent areas over the next three years, really, um, to see that through. So we know where we're going now. Um, it was the first inspection the school had ever had. So it's, it's good to know and have, have those gradings. We're particularly proud of it. They're very good to receive for ensuring wellbeing, quality and inclusion. And we know where we want to go next and how we're going to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I'll ask members, I can see that Council McCabe wants in first. Stephen? That's going to be, I didn't want in first. I, I just would have liked, <laughs> liked to come in. I'm, I'm sure Councillor Wilson would have wanted in first. Uh, but, and I congratulate you. Just, you just beat me to it. Yeah, uh, fa faster on the draw. Uh, can I congratulate Lauren and all the staff team uh, at New Ark and indeed the, the pupils of New Ark? and uh, indeed also the, the parent body who are very supportive of the school and work uh, tremendously hard and, and particularly raising funds for the school. Uh, it's a very good report uh, and it's very pleasing to see and I'm sure and confident and under Lauren's leadership that New Art will go from strength to strength in the future. I was going to ask you a question to, to Lauren. It, it might be a pretty sensitive question and I'm sure you need to be diplomatic in how how you, you answer it. But we have had challenges in terms of the approach to inspection in the past um, from, from the inspectors. And we've obviously seen a fair amount of controversy in England over the approach to inspection mm -hmm. as, as well. So it would be, it'd be useful to, to, to get that feedback from how you felt the, the inspectors, I suppose, performed and, 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 and worked with you and your staff to... To, to ensure that you get that opportunity to, to demonstrate what, what you wanted to demonstrate? Yeah, I, I can't fault them at all, Councillor McKay, but they, um, I think they were really transparent in what the process was going to look like. I personally wanted to be really prepared for it, so I had spoken to um, Kirsten at Kings Oak and, and Liz at Wynn Hill about what the process looks like at this moment in time. So I had already been gathering my questions for them. I met with Maria Spears, who was the managing inspector beforehand on virtual calls and a couple of times before they arrived. And actually, as a team, they really went out of their way to put us all at ease. Um, so I, I, again, I can't fault the process. It, it really worked for us. I think I made it clear to staff, though, that this was our opportunity to write our own report. So make sure they see what we want them to see whilst they're here. And, and actually, they did that very well. And the inspectors did comment. Um, when they were given the feedback that they'd never really had so many people sort of chatting their door and asking them, can they go and see something or can they see that or can they show them this? So um, they were really supportive of us. They told us how much they enjoyed the school, um, that the ethos was so inclusive that they'd love their time there. So I, I can't I can't fault them. And there, there has been an opportunity to provide feedback to the inspectors as well following the inspection. And, and actually, I don't think Michael mentioned it, but because of the work that we're doing around that 3.1, they've actually asked to come back um, as part of their thematic inspection around bullying, particularly to look at highly effective practice. So I've had an email today to say that they're going to come at the end of May. And again, I'm not worried and my staff aren't worried because of how supportive the process was the first time round. Thank you. That's very good to hear that, Lauren. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Thanks, Lauren. Have we got any other member? Oh, was David Winton? David? Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Um, I very much endorse what Councillor McCabe has said. Um, this is an absolutely excellent report. Um, I've been attending uh, uh, the Parent Council and various school events at New Art for 15 years, and I've seen it steadily growing into the, the strong school it is now. It was a combination of four schools, which I don't think is attempted very often. And it did take a while at the beginning for several years mm -hmm. for everything to merge in and for things to go forward. They now are going forward and the, the, Lauren and her team thoroughly deserve this report. I'm particularly impressed as it's the only non-denominational school in, uh, in Port Glasgow 
how they're working with the chaplain, the Reverend William Boyle from New, New, Old Glasgow New Parish Church, and also the general contribution to the community by Newark. They're doing a very, very good job there. So, Lauren, congratulations to you, and as Councillor McCabe said, to the staff, to the children, and to the, 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 the parents. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth? Thanks, Camilla. Just to add to that, really, just congratulations, Lauren. What a fantastic milestone in the journey on New York Primary. It's fantastic to, to see the detail in the report that's here. Can I just ask a question? Did that pick you up right more? you said that this is the first inspection report that the school has ever had? Yes, it is, yeah. Um, the school opened in 2008 and they, they had never had an HMI inspection. So it's been something that people have been waiting on a long time. So it is it is good to know now where we are um, and everybody feels quite settled that, uh, you know, it's happened now. <laughs> um, we've got our plan going forward. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Can I come, come back in? Yes, well, that's astonishing. That school can be open for fifteen years, and surely, or, or is it not astonishing? Should I get my, my get back in my box? No, is no, it... no. I'll let Ruth comment on it, or Michael. Ruth. So I know that uh, HMI are looking at the uh, the rate of inspections, not the range, but the rate of inspections, and um, to catch up certainly after COVID. Um, and to be fair to HMI, they, they have to do a wide range of different types of schools in different areas as well. So previously, it wasn't always on just an eight-year rota. It had to be with the, whether or not there was a, a, a proportion of rural schools and large schools as well. So yes, but it is, does seem rather surprising that it hadn't been, uh, been uh, inspected in that time. Okay, what's that? Start astonished. Um, any other member? Uh, Lauren, just uh, the rest of me can say thank you very much for your, your attendance today um, and please pass a, a regards back to the school. I know you've got good links with it, all the elected members up in Port Glasgow, so please put our, our thanks to your teachers and your, all your staff at, at New York Primary School. And we'll let you on now because I know how busy you're going to be. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then can we go back into the main part of the agenda now? Can I welcome Jim along? Jim, the only thing you've actually missed, um, we've deleted uh, agenda item number 12 from the agenda. That is the amendments to the implied policy on emissions in placement placing uh, in mainstream schools. So that's now been dropped the agenda. Okay. Uh, can we move along to agenda item number six, which is the education revenue budget? Um, Sorry. Thanks, Camila. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, This is the Education Revenue Budget Report for period 11 up to the end of February 23. Uh, the 22-23 Education Revenue Budget is currently 94.39 million, and the latest projection is an underspend of 701,000.7% of the total budget. And that's a reduction in expenditure of 158,000 since the period nine committee report. Uh, section 3.3 of the report provides details of the main variances responsible for the projected underspend. And as previously reported to committee, the main variance to note is the underspend for teachers. This has increased from 695,000 at period nine to the current 875,000 at period 11. And that saving includes a uh, uh, 661,000 credit for the teacher strike days. Uh, so, committee are asking about the projected underspend of 701,000 for the education part of the committee, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Ian. I'll open up to questions. Can't see anything in the room, and I can't see anything in the chat. Can we agree the paper? Agreed. Agreed. Um, Councillor Wilson, can I ask you to put yourself on mute when you're not speaking, if you don't mind? Certainly, convener. Thank you. Can we move on to uh, sorry, agenda item number seven, which is the Education Capital Programme. Um, and is it Eddie that's going to start us off on this? Eddie? Yeah, thanks, convener. Um, I'll just briefly touch on the, the items within the report. Uh, there's a note in the report on the Guru Primary School project and the ongoing um, negotiation of the final account with the contractor. And we're just currently reporting on the over expenditure um, 
Also noting there that the, the previous um, committee had considered utilising the free school meals allocation for 2022-23 to, to allocate against that over expenditure or having to revisit that position. That's expanded in the, the no note later on in the report on free school meals um, due to the allocation for this current financial year being put on hold by the Scottish Government. So um, still negotiating the final account for group primary school. The work has been complete since December um, and there's an official opening plan for uh, Tuesday the 16th of May of the extension. On the life cycle works, um, just let me note there that the previous year's um, programme had been completed and they were now uh, well into the planning for the current financial year. There's some significant work, including artificial cap foot replacement at three schools, um, the 3G pitches um, uh, and, and a 2G pitch at Inverclade Academy. Active panel refresh continuing across four primary schools and LED lighting upgrade and the usual range of elemental work across the estate. Um, and just noting on the free school meals, um, as I mentioned earlier, the position has currently been reviewed by the Scottish Government. The allocation that they had indicated would be available for this financial year has been put on hold. So we are utilising the previous year's allocation to take forward work across a number of the schools in the kitchens, um, planning on how we're going to take forward the P6, P7, P3 meals. And hopefully we'll get that work completed over summer. But that'll be subject to managing to get the tenders out and back and um, that work completed during the, the school summer holiday period. Um, brief note on the 1140 hours projects and just the last remaining earmark reserve for that. Um, work was completed at Blair Moor, Hill End, Hume's Bay was completed and recently was um, managed to be signed off for building control. And we've got one last project at King's Oak that we're hoping to progress with that last uh, element of that funding over school summer holiday periods. Um, happy to take any questions. Hey, thank you, Eddie. We'll not for any questions. Can't see in on the chat, and I can't see in. One, sorry. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. So, under um, three point five, general lifestyle life cycle works with lifestyle. Um, someone else. Um, so I noticed that the two schools have got three G. So uh, and never played academy's got two G. So at the end of this works, will all of those end up be three G, or are we just replacing two G and Berkeley's academy? Yeah, through you, convener. Um, the, the pitch provision across the state varies. So Inverclyde Academy actually has a full size two G pitch and a full size three G pitch and a two G mugger. So we've already replaced the three G carpet at Inverclyde Academy earlier in the program. So that, that one's already been replaced. This is us getting to the 2G, which is predominantly used for hockey um, and other multi-sports. So that school has got a 3G pitch already. Um, same as a community campus, it's got a full-size 3G and a full-size 2G. The only school there with one full-size pitch is St Columbus, and that's just due to the site constraints. Um, and that 3G pitch is a, a short pile carpet, so it is um, suitable for uh, hockey use as well as, as football. Uh, that's a bit of detail, but as I say, that we try and um, be as flexible as possible across the state in terms of the carpet types and variety. Great, great, thanks. Uh, and just my second question on the free school meals. So what do we do if we can't progress with the tender? Have we got a plan B over the summer? I think maybe Tony can come in on some of that, but as I understand, um, there, there's a plan B and, and they, will, they will potentially manage. Um, if we don't manage to get all of the alterations done in, in the school kitchens, we're certainly targeting the, getting the alterations done. It's just it varies from school to school how um, much is done. So some of that involves new ovens in a couple of schools. Others, it's simply a case of maybe an extra freezer. So as I say, well, we're targeting the, the school summer holiday if, as we, if we can, but maybe Tony can take, take the question on plan B. For it. Yeah, I mean, I could cover this later on, but, but I, I suppose I could just cover it now. There, we're confident that even without all the alterations, we'd still be able to offer this because our experience has shown that not everyone automatically takes up the free meal um, on day one. So we're confident that through the course of the year, we will we'll still be able to deliver on this. Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Any other member? Well, the member, can we agree the recommendations? Please. Can we move to agenda item number eight, which is the education and communities 
delivery and breaking up, Johnny. He's got something. Can, can you hear me, David? He's got something. David, can you hear me? He's gone. David's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Councillor Lawson, David, can you hear me okay? I hear you now, yeah. Okay. As long as you can hear me, that's the most important thing. We'll move on to agenda. Agenda. Tony was breaking up. Number eight. Um, uh, Ruth. So this is asking for approval of the Education Communities Committee Delivery and Improvement Plan. Um, note there's a different format for this plan and that the uh, plan was around the, the committees rather than pre as previously with the corporate directorate. And there will be regular updates of key performance indicators and the delivery of the plan. And that this is the first iteration of the new style of the committee plan, and that it may be subject to some ch changes as we improve, approve, and improve and adapt as we go along. Okay, thanks. Ruth, obviously, it was subject to a briefing earlier on today. Uh, do we have any questions? Can't see anything in the room. Stephen. Yeah, yeah thanks, Kunri. As you said, we, we had a uh... The elected members, and we had had a briefing on this earlier today. So I'm not going to ask anything specific on the report. It's, it's maybe a general point which uh, applies to all of the the committee delivery improvement plans. I mean, we often have reports on performance as part of a pretty heavy agenda, uh, and it might be useful the the corporate management team thinking going forward what's the best way in a sense to, to get a, a real proper discussion on on these type of re reports and, and i think potentially having a briefing in advance of the the, the, the committee would be useful uh, rather than necessarily just having it solely on the agenda for for a committee so I just ask officers to to maybe give some thought to that Okay, I can see uh, Ruth is, is nodding. Is that okay, Ruth? Yep. yep. Okay. Any other questions? If not, can we agree the report? Agreed. Can we move on to the education update report, overview of local and national initiatives, Mike? Thank you for your convenience. A brief update report um, to committee to sign um, the report sections 1.3. Um, since we've last met, there, there haven't been any um, inspections of any of our establishments. Having said that, I'd like to go and jinx it and get one tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I've given you everything that I can at 3.2 around education reform. It's, it's still progressing around us. Um, what we've had since we last met is um, a sort of indication ahead, if you will, around where we are with the, the Hayward review of um, qualification and assessment and kind of sense of potential direction of travel, um, moving away from um, exams in S4 to a sort of a diploma approach um, and reducing the sort of focus on the high stakes examination S5 and 6. But that is only at the moment a heads up and there's been a further window of consultation um, that opened up for further feedback. So I'll continue to try and keep you as up to date on the reform process as I can. There's not as much I can tell you about the education bodies reform process, although I believe even over the last few days something has begun to emerge around, around that, but it's nothing concrete. At 3.4, try to come back to the previous question that maybe Councillor Robertson asked um, at the committee. This was in response to an annual report around the action for children in the mental health tier two service, around the impact that the tier two service may or may not be having on tier three. Um, I think um, I, I'm Going to have to continue to pump down the data on this one because what I've been able to get for you, it, it, you'll see three point four is a picture of what's happening at the um, health board level. Um, I'm still to receive information about what that looks like at the client level, but certainly as you note, there has been over the past two years a thirty percent increase in referrals 
um, exactly how that's all, what the interplay of that is, when that's replicated for us and for Clyde. I've asked for the questions and I haven't, I haven't yet got an answer to that. But clearly, um, it's very difficult, as I think I answered the first time you asked the question, Councillor Robertson. Um, it's, it's a challenge to see whether or not the Tier 2 service is having an impact, because I think, as we touched on earlier on today, there's a general um, increase in mental health challenge across the country, um, which is possibly exacerbating being clear what would it have been like if we hadn't had the Tier 2 service. So it's not one that I've given up on trying to get an answer, but I've not quite got the data yet. It helps to really fully get the picture here with Clean and Clyde. And lastly, it's just for the committee to note that there's a consultation at the moment running, um, which is uh, on the, um, the learning hours consultation, the formal consultation from the Scottish Government, and um, we have to respond to the 13th of June. And um, we've begun to draft our, our service response to that, which we will share with the conveners. Meters of the committee and intend to get that back well before the day. But been, this is about the standardisation of the length of the school week, essentially. Um, and obviously, we'll get that back through conveners in due course as to any questions. Thank you, Michael. I'll let Elizabeth in first. Elizabeth, you want? Thanks. Just in, in, in sort of direct response to your update on the tier two and tier three, um, are we? Are we are we at the stage where we think it's problematic that we can't get access to data? Is there is there an actual blockage or is it just something that people have and because it's new-ish, we've not had the opportunity to ask for it before and therefore there's no system around it? Or are we at, have we actually got a problem here that we need to, to tackle through terms of services plan or, or whatever? Uh, through you, Camina, I don't believe there's a problem getting to the data. I just haven't got it yet. I've been chasing today again for it. So okay. I don't think we're not going to get it. I think it's just taking time for people to get that data. It's not data that sits within my service. So yeah, to help us understand, but clearly the, the overall children's service plan has within it in mental health as a key. So we need, to, we need to understand that data better, generally speaking. We just haven't got it yet. Okay, okay Elizabeth. Yeah. Just think, I think it's something we should keep an eye on, to be honest, because it is new and, and if it's because there's not a system to get it, then I guess it's, the emphasis is there to get the system to get it. I suppose it's one of these things that will probably on Michael's report for the next okay. meeting as well, you know, just to give us an update on it. Uh, can I bring Francesca in? Francesca? Thanks very much, Convener. I think it's, it's really more of a comment. It's just thanks to... Elizabeth for bringing this question and also thanks to Michael for acknowledging the issues that we're seeing. I think without even without having the data, I think we probably know that young people are one of the groups most affected by the pandemic. And it's not to be alarmist about it, but you know, with the data that we do have sort of generally shows that young people in disadvantaged areas are disproportionately affected by the pandemic, camped housing and homeschooling and I think people who know a lot more than me about it would say that we might now be in the stages of a mental health pandemic. And we're looking specifically, I suppose, here about two of two in CAMS, but I think when the data does become available, we'll just make sure we want to use every opportunity to appeal and ensure that we've got the appropriate levels of funding and resources to support young people's mental health in Inverclyde, because I think we can't put too high a value on that. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Francesca. Hey, for me, Mike. Man. Yes, thanks, Tamir. Uh, just uh, for Michael and Ruth, I'm just interested to hear your kind of initial views on the Hayward report. Uh, and we're maybe going to do away with the S4 exams uh, at, at a time when we're potentially preparing children for work, preparing for work, preparing for further education. Uh, I've got in mind on it, but I was just wondering, as education professionals, what, what your initial thoughts are, if, if you have any at this moment in time. Right, Michael or Ruth? Who's, who's going first? Ruth first. I want to be there. Um, yeah, it, 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 it is still on, under consultation, and, and my understanding is it's not completely doing away with exams, it's looking at, at, at different ways of assessing an ongoing assessment as well. And I think we do have some lessons to learn from the pandemic, um, certainly about the, uh, the crush towards exams and the final cramming towards exams, and actually the, the idea that ongoing assessment would be part of the uh, assessment process. But um, I, my, own, my own thinking is there's a long way to go yet. Um, but I do think that probably um, the breadth 
uh, for the exams on what what uh, what what is assessed and how we assess probably did need to, need to change. Um, we were we were living in a, a very old, well not antiquated, um, but a very traditional model. That's the word I was looking for. Um, and we see that universities and colleges have moved towards different methods of assessment, um, and the young people will be. Um, uh, uh, exposed to that as they go forward, as well as they would do with any vocational learning as well. Um, so I think uh, the, it, it's going in the right direction, but uh, the I's and T's aren't uh, dotted and crossed yet. Michael, would you like to comment? And not, not, not much more other than I think what we had a, um, a briefing earlier on, we kind of touched on um, the need to, within the committee plan, it's just in the previous agenda, I to look at the pathways for particularly the senior phase. And I think actually the system that we have known as SCQF, which basically gives um, you know, points to a various level of different, but there's a, a quite a variety of qualifications out there that sometimes schools aren't aware that they could be delivering and offering. And sometimes the challenge is having the capacity and the skill set both within school or across schools or in partnership with others to deliver on that. So I think there's already um, push from us as a service and the push from schools through, for example, the evolution of the DYW coordinators to open the eyes of, of pupils and, in fact, school staff as to um, a much wider and more varied offer than maybe had been traditionally in place and that there is absolute merit in qualifications other than um, the traditional ones, such as the hires. Um, and we are seeing some traction in more young people recognising, for example, and their families, the value of something like the foundation apprenticeship qualification. And it's just, there's different ways to recognise the broader achievement and set of skills that have come through a wider set of experiences, as opposed to, you're sitting, you're sitting high in English today. Um, I know Tony's daughter was going through that earlier on, but I was loving it with him. Um, <laughs> the big people in the room affected by it as well. And that's it, you know, that's that's your chance. And so there's that over timeness of it, I think, lends itself well to um, the core of young people right across the country, particularly in the country. So I'm very open to it. Okay, well, thanks for that. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Nothing on the chat, nothing there. Oh, Francesca, you want to go back in? Thanks very much, Convener. I think Michael touched on this, so it's kind of solid way, just about as we're going through the exam period. It's just a chance for me to say that I'm hearing so much from young people, specifically in my ward, that reflects how well they're being prepared for this assessment time in a way that seems quite different from times that some of the other elected members might remember from their exam days, that they're, they're just so it was just to say a thanks to all the schools for all they're doing to support young people through this time as they go through the exams. We often talk so much at committee about the results and the, the performance and the indicators, but they're, they're being really um, well worked through this process. Thanks very much. Thanks, Francesca. Mm -hmm. Convener, I think you're missing a couple of us. Yeah. I can't go on the line. Oh, okay. Stephen, sorry. Oh, sorry, Stephen. I'm looking over Ruth's shoulder here as well. So I've not got my own uh, computer on, so apologies. Uh, I'll bring Paula in first, Stephen, if you don't mind. Yeah, I think Paula was wanting to come in in the Hayward briefing. I, I'm, I'm wanting to come in in something else. Uh, that's good, so I've got it right then. Paula. Yeah, in, in terms of qualifications and the, the, the form agenda around that, I think it's important to note that this is about inclusivity and about accessibility, um, particularly for our ASN. Children and young people, the traditional model was to fit the pupil to the assessment, to give them additional time, to give them scribes and so on. Whereas the move now with the reform agenda is to change the assessment and the qualifications to fit the pupils. So there's a, a, a flip going on, which is very welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for your input. Stephen? Yeah, thanks. Jim, I was wanting to come in in uh, 3.5, the, the learning hours consultation. This is obviously part of the, the heavy-handed intervention by the Scottish Government when uh, some councillors had indicated they were looking at reducing the, the learning week, and indeed uh, a number of councillors had indicated they were looking at reducing the number of teaching posts and, and, and learning support assistant posts. Uh, I know we've now got a new... Cabinet Secretary, and we've now got a new Deputy First Minister, uh, and COSLA leaders certainly agreed last week that we would 
approached the government again and asked them to reconsider the approach that they're taking around these interventions. But assuming this consultation is is going to conclude and go ahead, and and it's no uh, any lack of uh, faith in you as the convener, Jim, but it would be useful just to get an understanding from Michael the type of issues that may well be reflected in in a, a response. Uh, I'll bring Ruth in, actually. Ruth? Yes, and uh, reading the uh, consultation, it would probably be our, our intention to, to run it past the leaders of all parties because there will be an element of uh, 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 political response and political um, nuance to it. So, um, to first of all, on the on the learning hours, whether or not we would as professionals um, advocate a reduction in learning hours. Um, now, Mike, Michael and I have not considered that as part of our budget savings. We haven't put that in front of members, nor have we, uh, nor have we looked at it. For the numbers of teachers, you will know that we, we had considered that as part of the, the budget savings, but now we have a, a mandate to maintain teacher numbers. So it's whether or not it is appropriate for government to legislate for the number of uh, teaching hours and uh, my sense is um, as, as, a, as a committee you would probably feel that it would not be um, wise to legislate um, around that and that should be up to the local governments as it is currently. Okay, thanks for that Ruth. Mate, uh, Stephen you want to come back in? Or... No, no I'm, I'm fine, fine with that Jim and I, I'm, I'm happy, happy with it to be run by the well, I, was, I, I was just going to say, I, I can give you my commitment that it uh, will come to the Labour group, Stephen, so you'll be able to have your input at that point and find to it. Any other questions? If not, can we agree the paper? Agree. And can we move on to agenda item number 10, which should be well versed to, to members of the committee, but I'll let Michael introduce it. So, in three, you can, you know, this is um, uh, the report now to committee on the outcome of the statutory consultation um, on the process of changing William Moore Nursery School that actually uh, achieved already. There's been much debate and misunderstanding probably on my part as to what's actually to be called looking at things for clinics picks up this before, but I've got a new one Lynn. It's it's formally to be called William Moore Early Learning Centre. So that's the first one and my apologies for that. Um, it doesn't change the outcome of the process at all, which is that's such a certain end of 19 wants me to get the name right. And I think that's absolutely important. So the, the purpose of the report is to ask members of the committee to approve the outcome of the now statutory consultation process regarding leadership status. As you know, the Education Service carried a pre-formal consultation process throughout this academic year with stakeholders, and that was done during October and November. Um, we brought that to the committee in January, and then we then proceeded to statutory consultation, which we have now done. At 1.4, we outlined that the statutory consultation process ran in line with what is legally required of us, which was from the 27th of January through to the 14th of March. And the full background in the process <coughs> all is outlined in Appendix 1 attached to the report. As you'll know, Education Scotland has been part of this process, we're fully involved in the consultation process. And you'll know that we've also um, through the report, um, which can be found along the appendices. Essentially, the HMI inspectors agreed to the proposal that we have put forward. It does allow for continuity of the education provision with the um, we will become the standalone early learning centre. And um, without going into significant detail, which I think is outlined in the attachments, and um, what we are proposing now is that, we, that the conclusion or the outcome of the consultation is that the Labour Arts School will close and will become with the amendment. Blue more our learning centre in August 23, and that's something that they can be looking at 2.1. I'm seeking questions. Uh, thank you, Michael. Do we have any questions? Can't see anything in the chat. Can we agree the report? Agreed. And can we move on to agenda item number 11? Now, agenda 19 is a substantive agenda item. And can I firstly um, thank Ruth, Michael, Tony, and all the education team? Um, for listening to the wishes of all elected members within and play and, and bring this paper to us, and also Eddie as well for the input he's had. Um, I, th I think it's a, a fantastic achievement that we'll be able to bring this forward. And with that, I'll let Tony introduce the paper. Tony. 
Thank you very much, convener. So, yes, this paper, and we touched on it earlier, is proposing to, is asking committee to agree for us to the early adoption of free school meals for P6 and 7, which would mean that all primary uh, pupils would now be um, eligible for a free school meal. Um, there are some, um, as we touched on earlier, there are some adaptations required to some of our kitchens, um, but these are not um, significant enough to, to delay um, the implementation of the policy. And as I said earlier, I'm confident that we will be able to, through the course of the year, um, be able to get all that work completed and also the schools adapt in such a way that we can we can prevent this policy. Um, so I, I'm happy to take um, any questions on it, um, but obviously, you know, we um, I, I'm not sure where we're placed in the whole of Scotland in this, um, but certainly um, it, it would be um, obviously a recommendation is to agree to the to the implementation of free school meals in P67. Uh, Tony, I'm, I'm quite confident that we're the first local authority in Scotland to, to promote this. Um, so I, I think uh, it's a feather in our cap. And, and what we're doing it is we're doing it as a, a one of our many poverty uh, measures and an anti stigma mm -hmm. measure. But with that, I'll bring Liz within first before any more comments. From you. Thanks, thanks, Kimira. It's really just to echo part of what you, you said. You know, this absolutely represents the best of us. The absolute best of us when we can all come together and make a decision that, that we think is best for the families that are in our area. We're doing it ahead of the game. You know, we're, 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 we've, we've pushed hard to, to sort of make it happen against um, seesawing of, of opportunities with funding, etc. And I'm really pleased that we're at the position where we, we can do this. We know we're not over the line yet and there probably are still um, little hurdles that we have to, to get across. But the the hurdle of yeah, we can actually do it and we can can, can work towards them is a is a great place to be. So it just it does it represents the best of Thanks, Elizabeth. I'll bring Councillor Wilson in and then Councillor McKay. Yeah, um I just have a, a concern here about the the spending of money. Um we uh, I spoke earlier today about how uh, we've pretty well looked after education budgets over the last decade. We've spent a lot of capital on um, on our school estate. We all agreed to do this. We're happy to do it. We have uh, costs of nursery, uh, primary and secondary pupils way, way above the Scottish average. We're happy about that. It's shown itself in the, uh, the literacy and numeracy figures where we're sitting in the top sort of 25% in terms of success there at at uh, P1, P4, P7, and, and S3. So there has been there has been good benefits from it. But we're now at the stage where there are other departments within the council who are suffering quite badly from cuts that have not happened in education. And I think here, what we're seeing today, the spending of this capital, um, the spending of revenue, there's also the Gallic situation, which I did vote against at the, at the briefing we had, I think these are luxury items, while some other some other parts of uh, of Inverclyde are suffering. And I look particularly at uh, grants to volunteer organisations, which have been cut. I was also I was last Sunday at Port Glasgow uh, Girls Brigade Second Company display uh, in the church, and there they are. You get young girls there. They're at St Michael Primary and New Art Primary. And from July or August, they're going to have to pay to use the uh, to use the school for their meetings for the girls' brigade. So we've got to be a bit conscious here that we're throwing money around at, uh, within education when there's other parts of the business yeah. um, really needed. Now it's worked really up to now with literacy and numeracy. Um, I think we're now we're now moving a bit too far, to be honest, convener. So, David, I, I would bring our officers in, but. I know you know this, that this is ring fence money that we've got from the Scottish Government. So we kind of take this money and spend it in grants to bulwarks. Um, so, uh, you know, for, for me, I'm, I'm quite happy to say we're working in partnership with the Scottish Government. Yep. What we are doing in Inverclyde is we've been doing this quicker than every other local authority, mainly because we have prioritised education over the last 15 years with, with Stephen as a council leader and with help from everybody within the council, every party within the council, and that's why we've been able to do this. 
the argument that we can have and the argument that, that we in this chamber has had over many years is the argument about um, universal benefits against targeted benefits, right? And that is an argument that we've done in this chamber, but I think we were all in agreement that three school meals for primary schools were the right thing to go to do. It might be more difficult in secondary schools, but for primary schools, it was the right thing to do to stop stigma and as a, an anti-poverty measure within the client. So with that, I'm not going to mention again, I'll bring my council leader in, Stephen. Stephen. Thanks, Jim. You've you've saved me five minutes from responding to Councillor Wilson there. Uh, I, I very much welcome these proposals. Uh, I've always been a supporter of universal free school provision at all levels of education, not just in, in, in primary schools. So I welcome the fact that the, the government is providing this funding to, to allow us to take this initiative oh, forward. But I, I do know the the, the First Minister, um, the new First Minister, starting a debate now on the sort of the merits of universal provision versus targeted provision and the clear suggestion from the government that they are not going to go on to roll out universal free school meals to, to secondary schools. I, I'm disappointed if, if if that turns out to, to be the case. I can, I can understand the, the, the merits of the argument. I just think there are certain things where universal provision is as important in free school meals as is uh, one of them but I, I'm an old-fashioned tax and spend socialist so I'm always up front when I, I see these type of initiatives uh, the reality is they need to be funded from taxation they need to be funded from progressive taxation if we're going to provide universal benefits to people then everybody who can afford to pay a bit more in tax has to pay for, for more than that. So I do welcome the, the debate that the, 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 the First Minister ha, has started, but I, I would hope I would mm -hmm. hope that we can get to a position where there is a political consensus at a, a national level and indeed a local level that universal free school meals in secondary should be one of our ambitions to deliver over the, the course of this council stroke Scottish Parliament. Uh, thanks for that, Stephen. I'm looking to see if I've got any more input, Lynn. Yeah, just, just a wee point for David, Councillor Wilson. It's just the first time I've actually heard a school lunch be called a luxury, which seems to contradict your point you made at communities about the quality of the school meal. Now you question the quality of school meals and now calling them a luxury. I just think kids having a meal during the school day is not a luxury, is a, is a basic essential item. So thank you. Okay, do we have any other members? I can't see anything online, can't see anything here. So it just uh, leads me to, to uh, again, to, to congratulate our officers for bringing this forward. I, I think it's, yeah, been, well done. it's been well done and they've yeah. listened to us over the last couple of years uh, and to be able to do this. I can understand that it will not be popular within some of um, uh, Ruth Binks's friends and colleagues that are, will be struggling. And no reason we're doing this, we've got to remember, is we've spent £270 million modernising our school estate over the last 15 years to allow us to be in this position where our school estate is, is capable of, of uh, bringing this in a wee bit early, plus the extra funding from the Scottish Government has allowed us to do this. So, can we agree the recommendations? Great. Thank you for that. And can we move on quickly to agenda item number 13, um, which is just a note of the school term dates. Um, is Lorna here? Is Lorna to take this? Um, is it yourself? Is it Lorna? Okay. Basically, this is the uh, approval for the school term dates for 2024 20, 2025. Can we agree? And can move over to school transport contracts, uh, Tony, agenda 14. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, this is the report that comes up every year, and it's just to get um, authorisation from the committee around the school transport contracts, which we've uh, worked with very closely, obviously, with SPT um, to do that. So, happy to take any questions on that. Any questions? Can't see anything in the chamber. 
Thanks for everything in line. Can we, oh, Councillor Wilson, David? Yeah, sorry, just stay. Uh, thanks for that, Tony. I think this, this is a very good report. I said one thing that I do notice, we've had a lot of problem with some of the taxi companies um, in the past year since, uh, since COVID. Shortage of taxi drivers, um, taxi drivers not turning up, and there's been particular problems, I know, at the shared campus and elsewhere within, within the school estate. I'm pleased to see that quite a lot of the um, contracts have gone to some of the smaller coach companies, um, which, which is very welcome, and that should stand us in good stead. Thank you, convener. Thanks, Dave. And of course, we're working in conjunction with SPP on this. Can I bring Councillor McCabe in, Stephen? Yeah, thank, thanks, Jim. I was just going to ask in terms of, so I suppose, the, the value of the contracts and the financial implications that basically, like for like, is less than the, the current year. Do we have an understanding of why that's the case, given, obviously, there's been a clear indication of huge pressures on bus companies in terms of increasing costs for, for fuel, etc., the cost of living crisis, driving up wages, etc. Do we any understanding how effectively you can make a saving? So, we, although SPT arranged this for us, we, we obviously um, worked with them and, and challenged some of the, um, the the contract prices that are coming through. Um, it's essentially down to a number of factors, and mostly it's about the availability of um, drivers and um, and the market forces in terms of de dealing with the transport contracts. So, there are some contracts we just simply can't. Um, get you know drivers for for certain companies and we have to go out with the the area so the value of the contract has has been increased because there's no other alternative and um, so it's quite we while we always try and achieve best value and try and keep the cost low there will be fluctuations in certain contracts and certain routes because of the, the lack of availability um but i think we've we're, we're quite fortunate um and it perhaps might be because of the decision we made during covid but we, we tend to have a fairly good relationship with our, our bus other bus companies and we Thank and they do prioritize us so sorry Stephen's okay yeah, yeah I'm, I'm fine with that thank you Councillor Wilson wants to come back now. yeah you just I'm absolutely right what Tony says if you take contract 7251 which is the Comicon primary from various farms round about and that contract 7251 has been has been given to Gillen's coaches. So instead of maybe using two or three taxis in that run, they're going to use a coach company, which will pick up from the different farms. So in combination between Tony and SPT officers, they've worked quite hard to get to get the best value, Stephen. Okay, thanks, thanks for that, David. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, David. Any other questions? Can we agree the report? Can we move to agenda item number 15? And this is Education Standard Service. This is the, the bit which, that we managed to get a report on from Michael earlier on. And thanks to Michael for, for putting that together so succinctly and so quickly as well. I'll let you introduce the report. So, for me, Amina, this is the, um, the draft of the Education Services Standards and Quality Report um, for a period April 22 through to April 23. And I know there's um, members and members of the committee in the room that were not at the briefing earlier on, so I don't want to, to rehash and go over it all again. But this is a, a requirement, legal requirement of the service to produce this report in line with standards Scotland Schools Act. And essentially, what we're trying to do here is pull up an evaluative summation of the work of the service over the last um, 12 months. And as I explained to um, members earlier on, really what we're looking to do is from this identify the next steps, the things that we need to do next as a service, um, and look at those in line with children's service plan, the overall council plan, and certainly the, the work of, of this committee. And, and certainly that's what we've, we've sought to do. I think whilst I, I won't claim I wrote it, a lot of different people wrote it, I was the sort of the the, the collator of it to make sure it flowed and made sense, and a tweak here and a, and a tweak there. But what struck me when I was pulling it together was the amount of um, 
individual actions. I mean, I think even in the first section there are 34, and probably the learning for us is that actually, whilst I'm, I'm pleased to say we've, we've achieved a lot of that work, um, probably going forward less is more, and the size of the plan that we had last year was very much due to the, the pandemic halting an awful, lot of, an awful lot of important work. And so it's actually been a very rewarding year, and we've managed to get on with some of our real core business, and a real keen sense now that whilst you're looking at a number of different actions or next steps in each section, they will not all become part of the service plan and what we've actually pulled together is sort of a maintenance agenda, if you like, of things that are now policy and practice for the service that we need to maintain and ensure that we bed them in, but we're limiting ourselves in the number of new priorities that we take forward. So without reading the entire thing to you, and your bedtime story, I have to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, I think you have the is the glue that holds it together. Thank you. <laughs> um, Elizabeth. Thanks, Kimira. Um, the definitely at one point in my life at least have been a chapter in my autobiography that read how I learned to love the standards and quality report, because it was the natural thing for me to love, I have to say. Um, particularly when I was involved in the, the, the group that was that was trying to write it. Um I think it is a really useful report, though, in terms that it both looks back and says, this is what we've done, and then looks forward and said, and these are the next steps. And has, having that one single report is actually quite helpful. And I'm just listening to what, what you said there in terms of the use of it and how it will be, how it will be sort of used going forward. Um, and I, I, I personally like the notion of a maintenance agenda versus improvement actions and, and separating the two. I'm not necessarily clear from the, the standards and quality report which ones are the improvement actions and which ones are the maintenance actions. So that would be useful to sort of know and also for the ones that are genuine improvement actions. I don't know that they, because I don't know which ones they necessarily are, um, but they might not all read across to our own one plan. So where do they all going to get captured so that we do genuinely track the improvement? Thank you. Uh, in, I think... You've kind of read my mind, have we had our time and our learning? I think what I would say to you is we are literally writing yesterday and today and meeting officers tomorrow the final, final draft of the improvement plan that will come out of this, the service plan, and that's going to go out to consultation with our headship group um, over the next couple of weeks. So that, I, as I explained earlier on, what I want the schools and our leadership establishments to have is a clean understanding of the services, priorities and how we them through having just last week shared the council plan with them. Um, and within that plan, it, it's much clearer, um, I think, what the priorities actually are and what the maintenance agenda is. I think going forward, Elizabeth, I predict this will be a slimmer document. I don't want to not obviously produce one. I am <laughs> grateful that you, you find it useful. But I think going forward in, in the Samson Quality Report, there will be potentially a clearer articulation in the next step section as to what would be a priority, what would be maintenance, and actually having worked or we taken those bullet points from the standards and quality report and worked with them over the last few weeks. There's actually a lot of synthesis has happened and many of them are saying the same thing. Um, it's just that that's what flows out of each action. So there's further work that we could do to improve the standards and quality report, as you've suggested. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Can I, can I just go? Oh, yeah. I'm putting, and then I'm going to bring Stephen in online. Ruth? And, and again, to build on that, and, you know, the standards... The standards and quality reporting format gives us a really good chance to have a good look at where, where we are. It's really good self-evaluation. The schools all do one, um, and that leads to their improvement plan. And Michael, Michael does the same with the education services. But on page um, 121, we've got the link to the children's services plan. Now, you, you've you challenged us with making sure things are joined up. There's just, we've already referenced the cross-directorate working and there's no apologies for, for that being in the uh, education part, but also in the children's services plan, because we just can't separate the two. We've got to work in a joined up way um, to know that what education are doing links in with what health and social care are doing, and it, it's, it's all linked together. So there are bits that sit with education, and Michael's made the, these links very, very well. Um, there are bits that will sit with HSCP, but there are bits that sit across, across the the uh, the totality and also with partners as well. So uh, it's the partnership planning versus the single service planning that we, we need to make sure that we put the correct amount of detail in. Yeah. Elizabeth, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Can I bring Stephen in first and then Tommy? Stephen. 
Yeah, thanks, Jim. So it's a very informative document, if somewhat of a long read. So I think uh, an abridged version would 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 be useful. My, my question is around supp suppose national oversight of this report. It's obviously, some are required to produce under statute. Do do we get any national oversight of it? And the second question is a, a, around peer review. We obviously had a discussion earlier on about the fact that we've now got this sort of peer review uh, of, of the schools in, in, in place. Is this something that we've got the opportunity to, to, to get peer reviews from, say, for example, through the, the sort of West Partnership approach? Thank you. So, first of all, if you new convener in Council of the K, we, we have to submit the standards and quality report to Education Scotland and the Scottish Government on an annual basis. My understanding of that is that they then um, utilise that to then create the overall um, picture against progress towards the national improvement framework. So we, we do have to submit it, I think it's by October, and we also at that point submit our next plan as well. So it is submitted, um, and um, I, I don't know that I've ever had any feedback on it as such, but I definitely submit it by the deadline. Um, currently, as you know, within the authority, we are running our own internal peer review programme. Um, what we have done on a couple of occasions is reached out to uh, colleagues from other authorities where we feel so, for example, when we did the peer review process at Craig Marloff, we don't have another um, head of an ESN school. So we had the head of Isabel Mayer from East Renshire come and join that team. We have one uh, a senior leader from a Gallic tradition come to be on the review at Wynn Hills. So we are pulling in the expertise from out with the authority when we need it. Um, we are engaged at an authority level, as we've reported to committee before, to ADIS Education Scotland and what's called the Collaborative Inquiry uh, a service level. Um, we, we were not, what we're not at yet is a, is a review model that would um, go beyond the local authority, but I, I can see in time that, that there is that advantage to being involved in looking at what other authorities or other schools are doing. So there's nothing formally proposed yet. Um, but we are certainly being involved and being asked to be involved in other people's reviews of schools or services, and we're, we're inviting people into ours. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, that, that's helpful feedback. I mean, I would have thought if, if the government and education Scotland were going into the, the ball and asking you to submit this, they should pro provide some some feedback. And and, and I know we, we're now got this sort of inspection of the educational establishments up, up and running again. I, I personally wasn't against um, inspections of education authorities, I, ha I have to say. Um, so I don't know whether that will come back in time or not, or whether it's just through the, the sort of national thematic studies. But I think we, we should always be open to to external scrutiny and challenge. And, and I think the West Partnership certainly should also provide the opportunity for us to work with our partners to, to, to improve uh, all that we do, in, including, the, I suppose, the, the quality of our, our reporting. I'll, I'll bring Ruth in on that, Ruth, you want to comment? Okay, so the West Partnership answered to a position where we're, we're peer reviewing each other's standards and quality reports yet, but there are two, two elements that we do take forward. The first is around the um, performance indicators. So we've got a, a, an agreed set of performance indicators where we'll, we'll compare ourselves against, uh, against other authorities in the West Partnership. Also every year, the uh, directors get together and look at what is on the improvement plans for each of the authorities. So actually, if there's something that's, uh, that's consistent across the improvement plans, then uh, authorities, uh, that would be taken forward as part of the RIF plan. And also, if there's a couple of authorities perhaps having a look at something, a deeper dive into something, then there's opportunities for those, uh, those to join up. But you are correct, there's no peer review of it, and also there's no... Um, particular feedback, although we do have a relationship with the, with the, the lead um, Education Scotland uh, person for the West um, to give us feedback on in general terms, but we, we don't get any specific feedback. Okay, thank you. That's helpful to know. Thank you. Okay, Tommy. Yeah, thanks, Medina. Uh, on page 89 of the report, it refers to preparing for headship. Uh, and uh, and the various programmes which uh, are being put in place to allow deputies to progress. But how much of a problem is it to, to recruit for these uh, senior positions and 
how confident are you that the, the actions you have put in place will, will resolve this issue if indeed it is an issue? Thanks. Michael? So through the convener, I think we've, we've had this question asked of us before, Council at the committee, and I think um, the number of applications we get varies um, from school to school. Um, I'm in the middle of a recruitment process just now, so I can't particularly talk about it, but um, it's been challenging to get applications with, with receipts. So we're proceeding to interview, um, but the, the number that we're getting um, is, is significantly lower, I think, than potentially getting back over a period of time. There was some work done, I recall, pre-COVID, some sort of local authorities sort of sharing of information of number of, I think it was even national, the number of application per posts. And we're not in a position where we've had none at all and we've been able to recruit. But I suppose you're, you're absolutely right. What I'm always looking looking at is who's next, who's, who, who's, my, who's my next head teacher? Can I can I see them in, in the staff groups? For example, we're in a school doing a review and I'm sitting listening to a principal teacher talking and wondering, is, is that the next person? I think what we do have in Inverclyde um, is a very structured leadership pathway um, at every level. And Alison McClellan, one of our education officers, has led on that quite skillfully for a number of years. Um, we are now looking at that principal teacher cohort and trying to ensure that we've got um, a, a mechanism to support them into, into deputy headship. But of course, what, what you require then is a deputy headship to come up in order for them to take that next step. Sometimes you might have to lose someone to somewhere else to come back because that's where the vacancies are. Um, so I would say certainly it's it's one of those areas I, I keep a very watchful eye on. Certainly the secondary sector, we've always had a very healthy number of applications. I think for primary it's a little bit different, I have to say. Interesting for our early years establishments, of course we'll go to Jackpot now, Blue Moor, we've had a pretty healthy um, number of applications at that point. And, there's obviously a, a very much imbued workforce there through 1140. It's taking time to support that workforce and build leadership pathways there, which we have been doing. Um, but I would say primary headships, and I, I know this is the case in other local authorities, um, it, it's, it, it's a concern. And I would I would say I, it's one of those, it's a watching brief I maintain. Oh, no, thanks very much, Michael. No, I, I think you're absolutely doing the right thing, you, and, and it's good to hear that. You, you're looking further ahead, and, and, and I'm assuming at some point that you may develop this into the, the primary sector as well, because it's uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a good move, and uh, pleased to see you'll do it. We all need to do have it in the yeah. Yeah. across the sectors. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, thanks for that good being yeah. uh, Can't see any other questions online. Nothing in the room. Can we agree that it worked? I agree. Um, can I do the appropriate resolution and uh, exclude uh, public interest from the next agenda.